Welcome back to the swamp my friends and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and downright terrifying horror stories that were sent in by viewers of the show. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode of the show, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode, and get ready for these creepy and downright strange horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. What the heck did I see? By Hixie. Hello, Swamp Dweller. I am a massive fan and have been for quite some time. I don't want to disclose my name due to privacy reasons, but I have had some weird experiences with demonic entities. It all started when I was around eight years old. We were at a family gathering and everyone was having fun but I was barely awake on the couch. I was with my uncle and his daughter. They were around 18, 19 years old. After the party, I remembered my uncle's daughter picked me up and took me back to the car, and I fell asleep once again. I woke up sweating for some reason. I vividly remember sitting on my uncle's lap in the back seat. I woke up sweating for a second time. And when I looked out the window, I saw we were about to hit this giant pale creature on all four legs. We were driving a van, and this thing's arms were the height of the car with yellowish glowing eyes. My uncle's daughter swerved the vehicle to avoid it, and due to intense trauma, I passed out. I woke up the following day with my parents sitting beside my bed. They were so happy to see me awake like I had been in a coma for quite some time. They said nothing but were happy to see me, but I knew something was wrong. The day went on and I didn't see my uncle or his daughter for a few days. But when they finally visited us, they acted strangely and asked if I saw anything that night. I told them what I saw, but they said I was dreaming. Moving down a couple weeks later, it was around 8pm, and I was playing some sort of board game with my older brother who was around 13 at the time, and all of a sudden, we heard banging musical instruments from the back room of our house, which would be used like a little jam room. I heard deep growls as well. The next thing I knew, my uncle's daughter barged into the room and grabbed me to take me out of the house. As we exited, I saw my uncle with a machete and a torch going into the back room as my mom and aunties watched. I don't remember anything else but those musical instruments and a deep growl. My parents still played off like I was dreaming or something like that. After these events, I started having sleep paralysis heavily, seeing the same monster watching me from the corner, almost covering half of the room's wall with its shadow. I always dreamt of this thing chasing me in my dreams or I was being watched. But one of the scariest events I ever had was when I was lying down in my mom's room with her reading next to me. I felt as if someone was trying to take over my body. I had the most profound urge to open my eyes, but it was impossible. I couldn't move anything but my fingers, but my hands and feet were stuck. Next thing I knew, my mom was screaming, and as soon as I opened my eyes, I fell hard on the bed and was stuck to the ceiling or something like that. My mom swears that I was somehow saying stuff in Arabic, there was just so many weird things happening. There would be weird Arabic writings and shapes outside of our house on the walls, written in some sort of charcoal. I'm now 18, living in Australia, and honestly, after all these years, I don't know what happened. I always was told that these were dreams or nightmares, and I think my family just tells me that, so I feel better about myself. Well... That's my story with some weird, tall, skinny, tall monster that we almost hit with our car that eventually ended up haunting my dreams for years. I don't really know if it was real. I don't know if it was just a fever dream. But I can tell you, it very much still feels real. I'll never camp without a gun again. By Robert. 
Hello, my name is Robert, and I live in Northeast Louisiana. A few weeks ago, my friends Drew, Gregory, J Jolene, and I visited some of my family in Washington State. Drew and I are 18 years old, and Gregory and Jolene are 19. We packed up all of our stuff in late October and drove from Louisiana all the way to Washington. We stayed for a couple of days, visiting my uncle and his small family. Then Gregory suggested we camp in the nearby woods on our last night. Drew and Jolene agreed, but I needed to be more open. I don't know why. A million different thoughts ran through my head at once, but in the end, I agreed. We borrowed two tents from my uncle and camped in the woods near his house. If we unzipped our tent doors, we would barely be able to see his porch light. That's how far away the cabin was. Also, he had no neighbors for at least three to four miles. After chilling by the fire we built, we all decided to call it for... After chilling for a while by the fire we built, we all decided to call it a night except for Jolene, who chose to stay up a little bit longer and enjoy the peace. I figured I would stay up with her too, why not? We stayed up talking for probably another 20 minutes until I saw something huge walking around. It was like 20 yards away at first, and it seemed to be 10 feet tall. Now I could be exaggerating, it was dark, but it seemed like the size of the shadow was exaggeratedly big. We both got nervous and got in one of the tents. We woke up Gregory, who quietly said, What the hell's going on? Still half asleep. Gregory grabbed his hatchet and got up on one knee. Jolene tried to explain what we had seen, but it wasn't making any sense to him. Go back to sleep, y'all, Gregory said, putting his hatchet down and snuggling back into his sleeping bag. After about 20 minutes, we heard the thing walking around our tent slowly. At this point, Gregory was out like a light. I grabbed Gregory's hatchet and put it in my hand. I put my other hand over Jolene's mouth to keep her from screaming. We suddenly realized that we had left Drew alone in his tent with nothing to defend himself. Jolene volunteered to step outside with the hatchet. She jumped back in as soon as she stepped out of the tent. She would not stop breathing super heavy. I asked her what she saw. She said she didn't know, just something vast and solid black. I grabbed the hatchet and stepped outside the tent to see it for myself. I saw the giant thing looking down at our tent. I just about pissed myself. I swung the hatchet at its leg out of fear and heard it scream and shout in pain. It ran off. I was relieved. The scream did wake up Drew and Gregory though, and Gregory asked what it was before any of us could speak a word. He looked down and saw the really big footprints in the deep mud. Drew looked up at us and said, Is that a Bigfoot? My cousin came running with a pistol and a lantern in one hand. What the hell was that? She yelled. Gregory pointed at the footprints. I ain't never coming without a gun again, he said with a grit in his voice. I couldn't sleep again until we returned to Louisiana. That was one creepy night. A Shapeshifter Ruined My Fishing Trip by Kyle E. This is the time I swear I heard and saw a skimwalker or shapeshifter with two of my friends. At the time I lived in North Carolina, I won't say where precisely for privacy reasons, but my friends Caden, Alex, and I decided it would be a fun idea if we went camping with some weed and some alcohol and just a 38 on us. We collectively decided to go to a nice trail near a lake that we all enjoyed, and it seemed relaxing, but man, was I wrong. It took an hour and a half to get to the campsite, so when we got there, we weren't really in the mood to set up at first. We wanted to talk or we wanted to walk around for a bit and see the lovely lake view. After we chilled out for a bit, we all agreed it was time to set up because it was going to get dark soon. So Alex and I set up the camp while Caden started the fire and put rabbit stew over it. This next part is essential. I remember Alex saying, Hey, can you help me with this? Because he couldn't put the rods in the loop. A little after Alex and I were done, we asked Caden to see if the dinner was ready, and he said it would be shortly. It was at this moment I suddenly felt cold down my neck, like I was being watched. So I put on my holster for 38. 
My friends noticed this and asked what was wrong. I told them I felt like I was being watched, and they shrugged it off as some sort of joke, and I immediately felt a little better after this. Fast forward three hours, and we were by the campfire, smoking our joints and drinking, when I felt a cold rush through me again. I didn't want to say anything about it this time, so I told them I was getting tired, and they all agreed. So we put out the fire, and Alex said he had to take a leak, and Kaden and I said fine. So we packed up trash and put out the fire. Not a minute later, we both heard Alex call us from the woods. Hey, can you help me with this? But it was weird because it was in a distorted voice and impossible because we saw Alex go right out of the camp and this came from the left. This freaked Caden and me out, so we called Alex on my phone to see if what he needed. I was already scared enough, I didn't want to go into the woods. He picked up and said, what? I replied, what do you need help with, man? And he said, what do you mean? I immediately pulled out my 38 and told him to get back to the site as quickly as he could. I stayed on call with him so I could hear the leaves crunching on call, but I didn't listen to it outside the camp, so I knew he went a little way. Then I heard again, Hey, can you help me with this? Now honestly, I'm not a tough guy on the inside or out, so my eyes started to tear up from pure fear. As I turned and saw Caden, I saw him with the same face. We both knew it wasn't Alex calling out, but it sounded exactly like him so we were terrified. It felt like an eternity, but most likely was only 20 seconds later when we heard footsteps coming from the right of the camp. We peeked out the tent and saw Alex with his phone. We told him what had happened, and he did not believe us. He said we couldn't handle being crossfaded, which was slightly true, but we told him that this was actually, like, not even a joke. This was real. He wanted to go check it out, so he asked for the pistol. I told him no, so he said, Come with me then. Me being stupid, I gave in because he was my friend and he was also calling me a pussy. We got out of the tent and walked toward the area. When we walked for about five seconds, the smell of pure death hit my nose and made me gag. I knew we were near a dead animal. Alex wanted to walk a little bit further, so we did. And then, that's when we heard it. Hey, can you help me with this? And we saw a seven foot tall, pale creature standing on its hind legs. Its legs were crooked. Its eyes had a white glow to it, and without hesitation, I pulled out my gun and shot six rounds into its chest. We all ran back to the camp when we heard it growl and scream. We didn't know if it was following us, or if it was because I packed the shit out of it, but we left as fast as we could. We packed up almost all we could, and I'm pretty sure we didn't leave much behind, if anything. This took place a few years ago and still makes me feel sick to even think about it. Please let me know in the comments what you guys think about this. Wild Animal Attack by J. Alvarez Hello Swamp Dweller, the following event happened when I was 14 years old. I am now 48. I have never told anyone what happened that day so long ago, but I struggle every day to forget this. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, in a town very close to El Yunque Rainforest. My friends and I always used to go fishing and explore parts of El Yunque. On this day, me and my friend Jose went swimming and fishing for some time since the school was out. We took our usual route on our bikes. We hid them and continued on foot up the mountain to the creek where we swam all the time. We had a blast with some tourists that found the stream. The tourists eventually left and we stayed behind. We started to do some fishing close by when we realized it was getting dark very quickly. We did not bring flashlights with us because we had forgotten, and around that time there were no cell phones. We struggled to find our way back. We were falling and sliding all around. We came to a stop when we heard trees and branches snapping ahead of us. We thought it could be wild pigs or dogs. So we climbed one of the trees and stayed silent to see what it was. A few minutes passed and Jose got down from the tree. He was trying to join me where I was. I can see him in the darkness due to the moonlight shining when he just disappeared. It was like he was swept off his feet by something. I kept quiet. Maybe I was afraid, but I stayed silent. I didn't even attempt to try to find him. I, I looked from the tree I was in until I heard him call my name. For some reason, something inside of me told me not to answer. I then saw him run past my tree, and five seconds later I listened to a commotion nearby, and he started screaming for help. I was petrified. I didn't know what to do. I was a child watching my best friend getting hurt. I blamed myself for not trying to help. I was just... I was just stuck in a trance of fear. I can hear him being dragged away by something in the darkness. I stayed on the tree for hours until the next day's light. 
I ran down the mountain without looking back. I grabbed my bike and went straight home. My parents were not home because they had gone to work. They did not know I was even missing the night before. Jose's parents alerted the police and I said that he was not with me the night back. I was afraid they would blame me for what happened to him. They searched for days and on the fourth day they found him, or what was left of him. His belly was torn open, his eyes and tongue were missing, and police said there was nothing indicating animal predation. So what happened to him? I think about this all the time. Maybe if I had helped him, he'd still be here. Why was I such a coward? I Never Enjoyed Camping by Anonymous I never enjoyed camping. I savored the comfortability that modern life affords. But every year, my old group of high school friends would go up to the same lake, set up the tents on the same shorefront, drink the same beer, and tell the same stories. I always did enjoy that. It was like having a lousy job, but all your coworkers were awesome. It was making it just bearable. So, for the two to three days a year, I put myself through crapping in the woods for the laughs that came with it. We'd all drive up on the Friday after work and usually take the Monday off following the weekend and stay until then. We'd park and hike two kilometers along the water to the campsite we always went to and set up there for the long weekend. The last time we went camping, I was running late. I had a project to finalize and it was sent back by my boss to be tweaked. I couldn't leave the city with my girlfriend Kat until after 9 p.m. A storm was at our backs the whole drive up to the country, and it seemed to be headed right where we were. Then we hit traffic. An 18-wheeler had jackknifed, and the road was getting cleaned up. The pre-storm rain caught up with us. Kat and I didn't get to turn off for the camp parking lot until after midnight. I recognized all four of my friend's cars parked near the waterfront. Then a flurry of texts came in from my buddy Jeremy. The reception was spotty, so you could never really count on communication that way. The text had been sent a few hours apart. Jeremy told me they'd switch sites this year, and they'd finally made it to what they called the island. The island was always spoken of as being forbidden, mainly because it was near impossible to get to. It was diamond-shaped, but longer than wide. It was surrounded by sharp rocks and filled with dense trees. A heavy current came at it, head-on, and split the water rush to both sides. This made it impossible to reach because the only side that wasn't overcome with rapids and sharp rocks was the backside, which had a high, rocky cliff that jetted up 30 feet above the water. The ridge had a large, flat surface that looked out onto the lake and would have been the perfect campsite. If only it were accessible. Because of the heavy rapids and rocks, it remained untouched and was the place everyone wanted to camp but no one could. Kayakers and boaters avoided the rapids around it because of how sharp the rocks were. It was a beautiful thing to look at, but treacherous and potentially fatal to attempt to conquer. That year, there had been a severe drought in the country, though. It had not rained in weeks, so the water was down, and the rocky lake bed of the rapids was exposed. You could now walk across the island. Jeremy said the group made a snap decision. They trekked across and camped on the site everyone had always wanted to be. He told me they had set up their tents on the rock slab that overlooked the lake and saved me a spot near the back. I felt uneasy reading the text. I didn't know much about the lake or water flow systems, but with the storm at our backs, who knew how long the rapids would stay down? We could get trapped on the island. Kat felt uneasy about it too, but we packed all of our gear and trekked along the waterfront to our usual campsite. From there, we could see the island and all my friends' tents on the rock slab that overlooked the lake. The storm had finally caught up to us, and the rain was getting heavier. Kat and I decided to stay at our usual spot for the night, and I set up a tarp overhead so we could pitch the tent without getting everything soaked. When that was done, we were both exhausted, and she crawled into her sleeping bag. I ventured out in my rain slicker to the lake's edge. I sent a few texts to Jeremy and the others. None of them went through, though. I looked at the island which was a hundred yards away and focused on the tents. Only two tents were visible, both with stationary lights turned on inside, causing them to glow like fireflies in the dark landscape. I couldn't see any movement though, but that was not surprising. It was late and they had all probably gone to bed. As I turned back to my tent, my flashlight caught strange shapes of rocks in the dried up rapids, like they all had abnormally curved edges. I didn't think much of it and joined Cat in the tent. 
When Kat and I woke up the following day, it was still dark out, even though it was past 10 a.m. The storm was growing heavier. We put rain gear on and went to the lake's edge to look out at the island. The storm had caused the water to rise, just a few inches higher, but it was starting to move quickly. The visible tents looked the same on the rock slab. The flashlights were still on in the same positions. No movement. We figured the idiots were probably still drunk or hungover and had no idea what the situation with the storm was. I yelled across to the island, but the rain and thunder covered my voice. Kat and I talked about it and decided to trek across the rocky floor of the lake while we could. We climbed down onto the lake bed, five or six feet below and made our way through the muddy, rocky terrain. As we got closer to the island, I noticed the strange-shaped rocks I had seen the night before. There were a lot more than I had previously seen. They seemed to surround the entire island. There were more rows of sharp rocks jutting up in huge pointed boulders with multiple carved and sharped edges. None of them looked naturally eroded and formed by time, though. They did show aging, but they didn't look like they had been there forever, if you get what I mean. They looked like they had been sharpened like fish hooks. No wonder kayakers and boaters didn't come this way. As I looked closer, I saw inscriptions carved into the sharper hooked rocks. The carvings were deteriorating, but I could tell they were symbols. Someone, long ago, was responsible for these symbols and hooks. We continued toward the island, narrowly avoiding the sharp rocks and slippery ground. Along the island's edge, we found a portion of stones that opened and gave an entrance. We climbed the rocks and made our way onto the island. The woods were dense and dark, so we decided to move along the side of the island and towards the rock slab and campsite. The storm was starting to get heavier, and boy did it make the climb up hard, but we found our way to the campsite and saw four tents. There was a soggy fire pit, some beer bottles and cigarette butts, loose garbage and foldable chairs, but no people. None of my friends were there. We looked inside all of the tents and everyone's belongings were still there, but they themselves were missing. Kat thought maybe they were in the woods. Perhaps even they found a cabin or shack on the interior, something to investigate or ride out the storm in. Then I saw the carvings. The giant slab of stone we were standing on had lines of the same symbols from the hooked rocks on the lake bed. Cat noticed them too and mentioned they looked indigenous. We found a rough pathway into the woods, but the path wasn't more than just trampled grass, shrubs and bushes, and some beer cans and cigarette butts. We followed the trail as it led further into the island's interior. The dense trees blocked out the rain from above and any light the sky gave off was long gone. The interior quickly felt like night, and the sounds of the storm drowned out. All we could hear were the tall swaying trees overhead as we moved through the mossy, vine-filled woods. The trail of cans and butts ended, and the path disappeared. We thought about turning back, but then we heard something. A whimper. It was coming from somewhere up ahead. It was animalistic. It sounded hurt and afraid, whistling upwards at the end of each whine. I continued forward. Cat followed behind me. On the path ahead, there was a long, nylon-looking rope. We followed it and found it leading us to the source of the whimpering. I realized I wasn't following a string. I was following a leash. Jeremy's pit bull, Oscar, was crouched under an upturned tree, trembling. He had several small slashes across his body. None were profound, but they all looked like they hurt. We approached him calmly and managed to lead him out from under the tree's roots. As we inspected him, it was undeniable that an animal had attacked him. Cat and I whispered to each other, deciding to take Oscar and get off the island and hike back to our car for cell reception. Something terrible had happened. We cut to the right, heading directly for the island's edge, and not back through the woods where we came. Not back to the tents. Then we heard more sounds ahead of us. They were echoing through the dark trees. Cracks, snaps, breaks. It sounded like something was splitting thick tree branches. Oscar started whimpering again and pulled away. Kat took that as a sign and started backing up with Oscar. She motioned for us to go to the opposite side of the island and cross there, but I needed to see what the sounds were. I motioned for her to go ahead and crept towards the cracking trees more. Up ahead, I could see a small clearing in the woods. I peeked into it and saw all the leaves and grass were red. In the center, a hole was dug into the side of a large hill. There were clothes strewn about, all stained with some browning red shade. Then I saw the bodies, if you could call them that. I saw Jeremy first, 
though it was difficult to tell it was him aside from the bright neon hunting slicker he always wore. His body, just like the others, had been viciously opened and exposed like a fillet. To my left was the source of the sounds. I think one of my friends, Tim, was ripped into pieces. Something was crouched between the two halves of his body. A tall, skinny, vile creature. The beast was all earth tone, greens and blacks and browns. It had tufts of thick, coarse black hair. It looked like it was sticking out on various parts of its leathery skin. It was solid and robust and clawed through Tim's thighs. The creature pulled out Tim's femur and bit down into it. I looked around at the other bodies and realized they were all missing their bones. The creature didn't eat their skin, their muscle, or fat. It wasn't interested in the meat. It just wanted to eat their bones, which had been torn, pulled, and ripped away from the muscles and ligaments. Even the skulls had been broken apart, and the insides cast aside as the head was devoured. I watched the creature's jaw grind down on Tim's femur. The chewing was horrifying, the breaking, crushing, and pulverizing a bone. Then, the femur snapped, and the familiar crack filled the woods again. A whimper came from the woods behind me, from Oscar. The creature jerked in my direction. I ducked behind a tree before it saw me, but I knew it would be coming. It hurt Oscar. In a low, crouched position, I started rushing through the woods, following the path Cat and Oscar made. But I wasn't quiet as I had hoped, and sticks under my feet began to break, echoing through the trees. A screech roared from the woods behind me. I ran faster, knowing the creature was aware other people were on the island now. It's island. I heard branches breaking and heavy movement behind me as the creature gained on me. Then I started to listen to the storm again. The trees were becoming less dense, and as I was getting to the other side of the island, I saw an opening and rushed for it. I got to the island's edge and was greeted by a raging thunderstorm. The water had risen, and the rapids were back, though they were only half their average height. I looked at the shore and saw that Cat and Oscar had made it across. I climbed down and quickly started trying to make my way to them. The rapids were at my waist and pushing hard. I kept grabbing onto larger rocks for support, but all of their sharpened edges kept cutting my hands. Then Cat screamed. She was staring behind me, at the island. I turned back, only for a moment, and saw the creature climbing down to the lake bed and following me through the growing rapids. The animal was taller than me and moved much faster than I, but it had the same problems trying to get footing. I kept going, Cat yelling for me to hurry, the beast behind me gaining. It was only feet away from me now, and its long splinter claws could almost grab my shoulder. It swung at me, narrowly missing. I was still another twenty yards from Cat in the shorefront, and I knew the creature would catch me on the next claw swing down. The only thing I could do was let my legs go from under me. Just before the creature swung down, I let my legs go limp. My body was immediately rushed forward with the rapids, and before I knew it, I was thirty yards downriver. But I slammed into one of the boulders, and a row of sharp rocks dug into my side and ripped through the bicep of my arm. Another, more poignant and pointier rock, put right through my shoulder. It was excruciating, especially with the water pushing me away from the boulder, causing the wounds to open and tear. I heard that horrible screech again and looked up to see the creature had done what I had done. Only the rapids had carried it further to the right. A sharp, long rock was sticking through the creature's abdomen. It had been impaled and was trying to pull itself forward and off, but the hooked edge of the tip was too jagged, and the rapids kept hitting the creature, forcing it back to the hilt. The creature didn't look like it was going to get free, and I realized I'd suffer the same fate if I didn't get loose from the rock I had been snagged on. I managed to pull myself forward and free from the stones lodged in my shoulder and arm. The hooks on the ends tore off a good chunk of skin and meat when I did, but I was free. I slipped, struggled, and fought to the shore where Cat and Oscar were waiting. I rolled both of my ankles and could barely stand up. Cat helped me up, and we looked back at the rapids. The rising water and heavy current were overcoming the creature. We could only see it from the chest, and it was beginning to give up. But when it saw us watching, it got a jolt of energy and was finally attempting to pull itself off the rock. We didn't wait around to see if it did. I did my absolute best to rush Cat and Oscar through the woods, and we found a cottage not too far. We called the police from there, and an extensive investigation started. But ultimately, all that was released to us or the public 
was a wild animal attack had left several young adults dead on an island they weren't supposed to be on. I still think back to the rocks and boulders surrounding the island, the sharp ones, the one I'd been stuck to and the one the creature died on. Up close, they were all stony fish hooks. I always thought fish hooks were used to catch something to eat, but I was starting to think these were used in the sense of keeping something from trying to escape. Whoever sharpened those rocks, however, they did it and they knew exactly what they were doing. I was a park ranger stationed in a fire tower. It had a strange set of rules. By Horror Writers 1717. When I first got the job, I could not believe my luck. I was a very solitary person. I loved to read and be alone. When I saw an ad for a park ranger manning a fire tower, I just about jumped out of my skin. Working overnight at a Walmart wasn't the best job in the world. There are some stories I could tell about that as well, but I applied for the job and was ecstatic that I got it. They only made me undergo a week of training before my first shift. Most of it was dry reading and ensuring I was qualified in CPR. They showed me the job's ins and outs and I followed in my car as we drove to the tower. In the middle of the day, it was awe-inspiring to stare at the underside of the tower looming above me, suspended high in the air by metal rivets. Once I started climbing the narrow metal stairs with hints of rust at the edges, I was somewhat less than excited. I was now terrified as I do not like heights very much as it is. I don't go all vertigo or anything, but I prefer to stay on the ground. Once we reached the top and pushed open the trap door to get onto the deck that surrounded the tower, I was doing a bit better. I opened the door that led into the tower's interior. Looking around the room made me forget all about the terrible climb. It was like a small apartment. There was a small refrigerator, sink, counter, cupboards, and a small table. In the center of the room was a table with a map permanently attached. Of course, there were windows all around. There was a 360 degree view as you would expect for a fire tower in the middle of a state park forest. The view was amazing. I could see the peaks and valleys for miles in every direction. It was a photographer's dream. The other ranger explained what was expected of me. We worked 24 hour shifts, so there would be times I would have to sleep, but I would have to set an alarm to get up and scan for problems at least once per hour during the night. During daytime hours, I had to watch every 30 minutes. There was a radio to report any trouble and a phone in case I needed to call the fire department. In my mind, I was already drooling at the thought of getting paid to take amazing pictures and sit around reading books. The ranger told me that it was essential that I read the rule book first. He asked if I had any questions, and I said no. He reinforced that I could not leave the tower no matter what until I was relieved. I followed him down the narrow staircase to get to my supplies, get it all out of my car, and pack it up in here. He got his truck and hesitated for a moment as if he wanted to say something else, but then he shut the door, wished me well, and drove away. I took three trips to get all of my stuff up to the top. Bringing a few grocery boxes in the house is nothing at home, but here it became life and death. I was near the top with a box in front of me when I stumbled on one of the narrow steps and nearly fell over the side. I paused for a long moment to regain my balance before continuing to the top. I suddenly realized that this job might not be the cakewalk I thought it was. I pushed that thought to the back of my mind and went for my subsequent two loads. Basic supplies, books, phone chargers, and cameras occupied the second and last trips. Once I was up for good, I collapsed into the chair. I was on my way to Napland when I heard a static over the radio. I jumped up and grabbed it. Hello? I said, but no one answered. I figured this was the ranger's subtle way of reminding me that it was time to do a check. But lugging three loads up tiny stairs of death had put a severe crimp in my firewatch time. It had nearly been an hour since the other ranger had left. I did my slow pan around the room checking each part of the forest for smoke and seeing none. Having completed my first go around, I celebrated with a water bottle while I put the groceries away. The cupboards weren't empty, but there wasn't any gourmet delight here either. There was nearly a whole shelf dedicated to baked beans that didn't exactly thrill me, but I had the supplies that should do me for a few shifts. I sat the bread on the counter and loaded the cold cuts in the fridge. I would get some more options the next time I went shopping. When I finished putting things away, it was time for another check. The sun was just beginning to set, so I grabbed my camera and took some fantastic pictures. I couldn't wait to upload them to my computer when I got home. As I looked around the room, my eyes landed on the manual. 
I realized I hadn't even read it yet. I sighed and took it over to the chair. I was sure it would have me out cold in no time. As I opened the book, a piece of notebook paper fell out. I picked it up and it read, quote unquote, the actual rules. Never, under any circumstances, leave the fire tower until you are relieved. Turn off all lights between the hours of 2 and 3 a.m. If you receive a radio transmission or phone call between those hours, do not answer. If anyone knocks on the trap door during those hours, tell them they'll have to wait until morning. Do not open the door. If you see a glowing object floating toward the tower, do not look at it. Cover your eyes and count to 50. When you open your eyes, it should be gone. If not, cover and count to 50 again. If animals surround the tower, don't go down to look. Fire your flare gun up into the air twice, one minute apart. Then lock yourself in the bathroom and hope for the best. I sat the note down and stared at it. Was this a joke? Were they having some fun with the new guy? I wasn't looking forward to getting hazed at 2am. I put the note back in the book and skimmed through the manual. It was a real snooze fest for the standard rules and nonsense. For the next check, I decided to use binoculars. I was rewarded by seeing a bear in 3 deer. I pulled out my camera and took some pictures, but the zoom wasn't as much as I needed to get some magnificent shots. You could still tell there was a bear, but it was a bit blurry. I decided to go camera shopping with my first paycheck. What's the use of having this spectacular view if I can't take any good pictures of it? Soon after sunset came the twilight. The sky lit up a brilliant orange. I took some more pictures and did my scan. I was just about to go back inside when I noticed a thin wisp of smoke in the distance. I grabbed my binoculars and tried to get a better view, but too many trees were in my way. I pulled up my compass, got a general direction, grabbed the radio, and called the ranger on duty. I told him I had a fire and gave him the direction and general distance. He acknowledged it and said he would go check it out. I stayed glued to my binoculars, waiting to see the smoke lessen. Minutes seemed to have taken an eternity as the smoke continued to rise. Nearly a half hour later, the radio came to life. Hey, rookie. The ranger said, Did you find it? Did you put it out? I still see smoke. Did I tell you the wrong place? I said into the radio all in one breath. Whoa there. He said. Everything's fine. It was just a campfire. A what? A campfire. He said. Nothing to worry about. A campfire? I repeated in a daze. Yeah, you'll want to see more smoke, and it should be a lot thicker and darker before you call it in. I stood in silence. My face beat red with embarrassment. Cheer up. The ranger said into the silence. At least you didn't call the fire department. I looked over at the phone, knowing I was mere minutes away from doing that. Yeah, thanks, I said. Sorry about that. Don't worry, kid, he said. At least you erred on the side of caution instead of letting the forest burn down. I put my face into my palm and shook my head. So much for an excellent first impression. Twilight had faded, leaving a few last vestiges of light as the clouds transformed from dirty gray to black. I realized just how alone I was out here when the canopy of the night entirely fell. Doing my checks from inside was nearly impossible. I had lights on, every window I looked out became a mirror of me reflecting back at myself. Alone in a wooden box suspended a hundred feet above the ground made it that much creepier. I stepped out onto the deck in the cool evening air. The total darkness was oppressive. I couldn't see anything. How was I supposed to see smoke? I sauntered around the deck, looking out blindly at the trees. As my eyes adjusted, I could make out some shapes of the mountains and even the soft glow in the distance of the nearest town. That was a small comfort to know that things still existed out in the world and I hadn't been plunged into this cover of darkness. I finished my check and stepped back inside. After being out in the dark, it was way too bright. I turned off the leading overhead light and light over the entrance. The room settled into a comfortable glow with enough light to see but not be blind. I was a little too cozy. I felt a nap coming on. I laid down on the surprisingly comfortable cot and closed my eyes. I woke up sometime later to static sounding on the radio. I reached for the radio to answer it, but something in my mind told me not to. I looked at my watch and it said 2.12 a.m. I froze, looking around the lit room. I thought about the strange rules I had read earlier. I reached up and turned off the light, plunging the room into darkness. As my eyes adjusted, I could see just a few things. I looked out the window and could swear I saw someone peering in at me. Just then, I heard static on the radio. There was a voice trying to get through, but it seemed weak. I waited to see if they would call again. A minute later, static sounded again. Beneath it, I heard the voice. It was a little stronger this time, and I could make out just something barely. It sounded like it said, 
help me. I said it in a feeble yet insistent voice. I reached for the radio again, but something made me glance at my watch first. It was 2.23 a.m. I faltered and didn't answer. Those creepy rules, I thought. What if they were real? I've already broken one by having the lights on. What happens when you break the rules? I sat in silence, wanting to know the answer, but at the same time not wanting to know. The, the radio came back to life, though much more prominent this time. Help me. Can anyone hear me? Help me. The voice sounded desperate. I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. It had a strange quality that I couldn't quite place. I fought the urge to answer, not knowing if I would be fired for dereliction of duty or not. This is what I was out here for, after all. I needed to answer, but my mind wouldn't let go of those rules. The minutes ticked by like hours. The radio sounded out its plea three more times, each time sounding more and more desperate. I watched the time, counting the seconds until three. When the time finally came, I picked up the radio. Whoever was calling for help, please state your position so I can relay help to you, I said. Who is this? Came the answer on the radio. This is a park ranger manning a fire tower. Well, park ranger, I've been on this channel all night, and yours is the first voice I've heard. That's not possible, I thought. I've had several calls for help over the last hour, I said. Are you sure? Absolutely, I wrote down the time of each call. And why didn't you answer them until now? I paused. What could I say? Because of a weird list of rules that told me not to? Ranger? I... I had... I said hesitantly. Extenuating circumstances. Extenuating circumstances? The voice repeated as though tasting them. And what circumstances would those be? Whoever this was, they weren't going to let it go. I'm not at liberty to say. You mean like falling asleep and breaking the rules? The voice said, sounding deeper, raspier, and more menacing. I froze. I hadn't turned the lights on yet, leaving the room in eerie darkness, which left me very exposed. I slowly panned around, looking out the windows and remembering the earlier feeling of being watched. You can look all you want, but you won't see me. The voice said. It's after three, I said, hoping the terror in my voice wasn't very evident. You have no power over me. The voice chuckled. It wasn't a pleasant sound. Normally you'd be correct. However, you broke the rules. What if I didn't know about the rules? I said, gasping at straws. Nice try. But you knew that you would be safe after three. Damn it. I thought. It picked up on that. So, what do you want? I said, fearing the answer. Rory. The voice said. Only now it sounded like many voices speaking at once. My legs turned to rubber as I stumbled over to the door and stepped onto the deck. The moon was rising half full, casting light into the darkness. I looked down and saw over a dozen large animals surrounding the tower in a circle, and each one of them was looking up at me. I dove back inside and locked the door. I frantically searched for the flashlight. Once I found it, I picked up the phone and called the ranger station. There was no dial tone. I hung up and tried again, but still nothing. I pulled out my cell phone and there was no signal. I paused to clear my mind. Okay, I thought. You're freaked out right now, but what happened? A weirdo on the radio? Some animals around the tower? This list is making you paranoid. Just then, I looked outside and there was a light off in the distance that looked like an airplane. The problem was, it was heading straight toward me. It was mesmerizing. I stared into the rapidly approaching glow until I realized it was going to ram into the tower. I found the best cover I could on the opposite side of the room and surrounded myself with as much furniture as possible. Since the furnishings were sparse, I dragged the chair in front of me. I covered my eyes and hoped for the best. I may or may not have mumbled one of those, I promise I'll be good if you get me out of this prayers. The seconds tumbled into minutes and nothing happened. I peeked over the counter's edge and the light was gone. I let out a sigh of relief and wondered why I hadn't heard any engine noises. I decided it was because I was too busy ducking for cover. Then it hit me. I grabbed the manual and pulled out the list of rules. There it was, rule number five, if you see a glowing object floating toward the tower, do not look at it, cover your eyes and count to 50. When you open your eyes, it should be gone. If not, cover and count to 50 again. I reread the rules and realized how many had come to pass. For a long moment, I thought that maybe it was an elaborate joke. Some of the rangers were yanking the rookie's chain. But there was too much I could not explain. The radio transmissions, the glowing lights, the animals surrounding the tower. Then I realized I had broken that rule too. I hadn't fired the flare gun as instructed. I dug through the emergency supplies cupboard and found the gun. I grabbed two flares and stepped out onto the deck. 
As I questioned the intelligence of firing bursts that could end up causing forest fires when I was supposed to be trying to prevent them, I heard a strange sound. I held my breath and cocked my ear for a better listen. It wasn't just one sound, it was many. I glanced over the rail side and toward the ground I saw all the animals growling and pawing at the bottom working themselves into a frenzy. I backed away, loaded the first flare and then pointed up and fired. It rose majestically, glowing blood red until gravity slowed its ascent and pulled it back to the earth. I watched closely to ensure it went out and where it landed, just in case. I waited a minute and fired the second flare. Watching where it landed, I stepped back and hid inside the bathroom as instructed. I knew in my heart that I would be safe from the animals if I didn't go down the steps. The radio sounded off, scaring me nearly half to death. Fire tower number five, the voice said. I've seen your flares and I'm on the way. Are you physically injured? No, none at the moment, I said. I'll explain when you get here. Roger that, in route. I tried to calm my nerves by thinking about what job I would apply for next and how unfortunate it was that this one didn't work out. I thought about what I would tell the ranger when he got there. I couldn't tell him the truth, but what else could I say? Some animals at the bottom of the tower scared me. I honestly considered calling him back and telling him not to even come when I felt heavy footsteps on the bottom stairs. I must have been daydreaming and let time slip by. I stepped out of the bathroom and went to the trap door. Are you already here? I said into the radio as I reached down to unlatch the door. That was fast. What are you talking about? Came the clear answer over the radio. I'm not there yet. I paused as I felt the footsteps come closer to the top. Where are you? I said quietly. I can barely see the tower. I'm probably a mile away. His words hit me like a sledgehammer. I looked down at the bolt I was about to unlatch and slowly pulled my hand back. Which direction are you coming from? I said. Southeast. I looked in the direction and sure enough I saw headlights approaching. The radio sounded again but with a slightly different voice. Tower ignored that last transmission. It said. I'm already here. Let me in please. I stared down at the trap door as though it wanted to bite me. Tower, let me in. It said more insistently. I backed away as something began beating on the trap door with tremendous force. The board shook with every impact. I stepped inside and locked the door, then barricaded it with the only loose piece of furniture. The chair. Tower 5, I don't know who is talking to you, but it isn't me. Do not open that door. Repeat, do not open that door. I backed into the bathroom with the flare gun in hand and locked the door. The pounding on the trap door became louder. I knew it wouldn't take much more of a beating. The whole room shook with every impact. I closed my eyes and prayed in earnest this time. And then my salvation came from the engine sound of a pickup truck. I knew that the real ranger was here. I listened as it came closer and then stopped. There was an awful silence for a moment and then gunfire. Over and over multiple shots, shot in succession. Then there was a full lull followed by more shots. The pounding on the trap door stopped as soon as the truck pulled up. The coast is clear, Ranger. You can open the door now. Came a voice over the radio. I put my hand on the knob, smiling to go out and greet my savior when I heard a weak transmission. Don't. Not me. It rasped. A heartbeat later, the screaming began. It was a gut-wrenching scream. A terrible suffering. I could hear it beneath me. All I could do was drop to the floor and curl up in a ball as the screaming went on and on. I closed my eyes and tried not to imagine that poor ranger being ripped to shreds by God knows what. Soon the screams lessened in volume and intensity as they were moving away. I rocked back and forth, hugging my knees until unconsciousness mercifully took me. I woke up to strange voices calling my name. I opened my eyes and people in blue uniforms surrounded me. I panicked and backed away as fast as I could until my back hit a wall. Calm down, one of them said. It's all right. I looked around the room like an animal that had been backed into a corner. I was ready to fight my way out. Are you injured? He said. My mind raced to remember where I was. I looked out the window and it was morning. The sun was shining and I could see deep blue clouds. Everything from last night came rushing to me. I looked around the room and saw nothing out of the ordinary. I'm not injured, I said to the EMT. Can you tell us what happened here? A ranger said from behind them. I looked over at the manual that contained the list and rules, and for a heartbeat considered telling them to read them. No, was all I could say instead. Can I go home now? The ranger glared at me. I know that they were wanting more answers, and they weren't getting them, and they were frustrated. Is he alright to drive? The ranger asked the EMT. They gave me a once-over, BP, lungs, and heart rate, and they didn't find anything to be concerned about. I'd say physically he's fine, the EMT said. The ranger sighed. Go ahead, he said but I'll want to talk to you tomorrow. 
I nodded and stood, gathered my things, and started toward the door. When I got to the open trap door, I hesitated seeing it had been hacked with an axe. I took a tentative first step, then another. Surviving a night like this only to die after falling down several flights of stairs would be pretty ironic. As I made my way down, white knuckling the railing the entire way down, I saw people busy at the bottom. They picked up shell casings with gloves and put them into plastic bags. I could see blood spots here and there, but no human or animal bodies. I saw the trail of blood as it disappeared into the woods. I stood on the bottom step for quite some time wondering if I was allowed to step onto the ground. I took the stage, bolted to my car, and stared at it for quite some time. I just... I just couldn't seem to get myself to turn the car on and drive out of there as fast as I could. Eventually, I turned the car on, got into the gravel road, and a deer walked out in front of me. I slammed on the brakes and slid to a stop mere inches from hitting it. It did not move and it just stood there staring at me. As I looked more closely, I saw blood in its nose and mouth. My heart skipped a beat when I saw a shred of ranger's patch impaled on one of its antlers. Its eyes bored into mine as I slammed into reverse and then drove, swerved around the deer, and broke every speed limit going home. I called my boss and quit as soon as I got there. Then I packed and started looking for a job in the city. Maybe I can find an excellent, quiet warehouse to guard or something simpler. But if it has a strange set of rules I'm walking out, no questions asked. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to help me out and slap that like button silly. If you enjoyed the stories even more and you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode. I upload them multiple times a week. Right now, we are going to hit a marathon of big, long compilations. We're about to recount all the scariest stories we've gone over for the year, and we're about to start throwing out some extra long special holiday story compilations. Thank you guys so much for supporting the swamp the way you do. I truly couldn't do this on a daily basis without you guys. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net, or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. You can also submit them on reddit at r slash the dark swamp. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all those other beautiful podcast platforms, be sure to give this a 5-star rating over there as it helps us grow on those platforms, and it's very much appreciated. I would love to know in the comments down below what your favorite story was tonight. It's very helpful to picking out better stories in the future. I'd love to know what stories pique your interest.